In the Bible, we often read the accounts of when God calls people. He called Abraham and he called Noah, Moses. The Old Testament is filled with passages describing different leaders, prophets, kings, who were called by God for different reasons. Even in the New Testament, we read of God calling Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth, John, for special reasons. And then of course, Jesus himself calling his apostles to, uh, to follow him. Now some may think that since this time, uh, God no longer calls people like he did in the past, but this is not so. Although the age of miraculous calling is past, you know, the burning bush for Moses, or the vision of Jesus that Paul had on the road to Damascus, these miraculous ways of calling people to himself. God still calls people through his word today. Now there are four calls revealed by scripture and each one is as genuine and divine today as the calls were in the past. So in my lesson this evening, I'd like to I'd like to share with you these four calls. The first call, of course, is the call to salvation. The call to salvation, Matthew 28, for example, verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there are a similar passage in Mark 16, 15 and 16. So this here, this first call, this is a call made to every single person in the world. It is the call to believe in God and His divine Son, Jesus Christ. It is a call to accept His sacrifice as our own payment for sin. It is a call to express our belief by repenting of our sins and being baptized in the name of Jesus. It is not a spectacular call as calls go. It's not a miraculous call. We usually hear this call in a lesson from you know, the preacher or maybe an invitation to church by a family member or a friend with the hope that that call will be made and heard. Perhaps a passage of scripture that we read that touches us and draws us into the word, makes us begin to think more seriously about our own salvation. And then of course, there's the pulling of our conscience, urging us to do the right thing, to respond to the call, to confess Christ, to be baptized. But the call to be saved is the most important message we will ever hear from anyone because it speaks to the condition of our souls for eternity. And so it's the primary call. Some have asked me, you know, why, why did you become a preacher? What was the motivation? Well, I became a Christian because I sincerely believed Romans chapter 323 and 623, that without Jesus Christ, people would go to hell forever. And that meant me. It's funny how that works. You're reading and it's always for everybody else. Wow, those people better be saved. Hell is a terrible place. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, that means me too. And so I responded because I, I really believed that God would judge and sinners were lost and I was one of those. Now I became a preacher because I believed what Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, that ignorance was not an excuse to be absolved of the demands of the gospel. The idea that people were lost and didn't know it, that haunted me until I decided that someone had to call them to salvation. And why not? It might as well be by me. For 2,000 years and until the end of time, this first call to be saved has first been made by the apostles and their disciples, and then since then by every generation of Christians in this world. 
the call of the gospel is the first priority of the church and it is the first responsibility of each individual who hears the call to respond to this call with faith and obedience. The second call is the call to sanctification. If you have your Bibles, I'll be going from one passage to another. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Some were some of you, or rather such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The gospel of Christ calls us to believe and in believing we're united to Jesus and saved from the consequences of our sins. Our sins deserve punishment and Jesus suffers that punishment on the cross on our behalf so that we don't have to. But being saved from the consequences of our sin does not change the fact that we have a habit of sinning. A habit that is well ingrained in our hearts and minds and lifestyle. On the day we're baptized, our sins are washed away and we're, you know, we're saved. But on the very next day, we continue to be the type of people we are, right? We continue to, we continue to sin. In other words, um, baptism washes away our sins and saves us from hell, but it doesn't change our character. It doesn't change our habits. The Holy Spirit helps us to do that. So in Acts 2.38, you know, Peter says, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit begins, and here's my point, through all the coughing and everything, here's my point. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit begins the call to sanctification, which is a draw to live a holy and pure life that is like Jesus Christ. Every time we are confronted with our sins, every time we become aware of a better way to act, each time we experience the desire to be more like Jesus, we are hearing the call to sanctification. The word sanctify means to set apart. It was an Old Testament word that referred to the holy things and the holy people that were set apart by God for special use, the temple, the priests, and so on and so forth. And so the gospel calls us to turn away from disbelief and embrace Jesus Christ as our Lord. Sanctification is the call of the Holy Spirit to leave the habits and the sins and the attitudes of the world and embrace the character, the concern, and the quality of life demonstrated by Jesus Christ. And so the gospel calls us to be saved by believing in Jesus. Sanctification calls upon us to remain saved by living like Jesus lived. And so the second call is a call to sanctification, a call that we receive continually throughout our Christian lives. The third call. The third call is the call to service. Let's go back to Acts chapter two, shall we? Luke writes, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Uh, another passage also in Romans chapter uh, 12. Paul writes the following, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, 
Each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to prophecy, pr proportion of uh, his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. The old saying is true. We have been saved in order to serve. Some, however, have the wrong idea about service. You know, we don't serve in order to save ourselves. I mean, the cross of Christ has accomplished all of that for us. We don't serve in order to make ourselves better people. Denying sin and self is what makes us better people. No, we serve God in Christ because it is our natural response to His kindness in calling us out of the world. We serve because Jesus served and this is the best way to demonstrate His love towards others. And it's the best way we can demonstrate not only our love towards others, but our love towards Christ. We serve in order to build the church and provide the resources to maintain the call that the church makes to all nations in order to be saved. Everything is interconnected. Sanctification which is the purifying of our lives, is to become like Jesus by avoiding the things that He avoided. Service is to become like Jesus by doing the things that He did. Today, the call to service is heard again in a variety of ways. You know, every time the volunteers are called for, I think Mike in his announcements there, there's got to be you know, a request for all kinds of different people to serve. You, what, what, it may have only been the announcements, you know? some people think, well, it's only the announcements, you know, it's not important, we, we can keep, I can finish my whatever I'm doing. But the announcements are part of what, what's happening in the church. So all of us heard the call to service because there were so many requests for help for different areas of work in the church. Every time the phone rings for help, every time you see a need and realize you have the resources to fill that need, every time you experiencing, experience the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the, the encouragement of the brethren, the urge of your own conscience to say, here I am, Lord, send me. The call to service is seen by some, unfortunately, as a nuisance an inconvenience, a, an expense, something to avoid at all costs. That's because the call to sanctification has been ignored. You know, usually sinful Christians don't like the call to serve because they're too busy being involved in the world. For those who are purifying their lives, the call to service is the opportunity to please God by offering something of ourselves to Him in the service of other people. For those who have answered the call to sanctification, the call to service is usually the answer to a prayer. Usually the prayer is, dear Lord, show me what I can do. Dear Lord, reveal to me how I can be fruitful in your kingdom. What do you want me to do, Lord? When we make those kinds of prayers, I'm, I'm very confident that the Lord answers those prayers. And sometimes those prayers are being answered by the humble piece of paper called the announcements. We need to pay perhaps more attention to that part of the service in the future. For those, as I said, who have answered the call to sanctification, the call to service is usually an answer to prayer and not something they feel guilty about or they don't need to do. And then the fourth call is the call to suffering. The call to suffering. Turn, if you will, to uh, 2 Thessalonians, please. 2 Thessalonians. Paul says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. And then in 2 Timothy, again Paul writes, it is a trustworthy statement. If we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. Well, endure what? 
Well, endure suffering. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. <clears throat> you know, I think most Christians are familiar with the ideas that we are called to be saved, to be sanctified, in other words, to grow and mature in the character of Christ, and called to be served. I think we're familiar with those ideas. But so many are surprised, <coughs> excuse me, even angry and depressed when as Christians they encounter opposition, inconvenience, trials, even persecution. What a, what a poor use of our spiritual energy when we see our sufferings as a waste of time. That's terrible. Some people think that being sick or losing our work or encountering opposition makes us lose our value as people, our value as Christians. But Paul tells us that suffering all by itself, regardless of the circumstances, if done in the spirit of Christ, is worthy of receiving our place in heaven. He says, if we endure with Him, Endure what? Endure suffering. We'll, we'll be with Him. He didn't say, if we work hard, if we produce a lot, if we're on a lot of committees, if we, which is all right. He just said, if we endure, if we endure suffering. It's not that we can trade in our pain for our salvation. That's a work. No flesh is justified by works. The point is that suffering in Christ is equal in value to service in Christ or sanctification in Christ. If what your life is about right now is suffering and struggle, then that is what God has called you to for the moment. Try to see that in that framework. And if suffering is what we have been called to at the moment, then we must respond in faithfulness and obedience just like when we respond to salvation and sanctification or service because Jesus is also the Lord of suffering as well. Unfortunately, as we grow older, there's more suffering in our life. Suffering because our own bodies are you know, not acting like they should, like they did but also because we're losing loved ones and we see others that we, that we care about who also may be sick. And we think, well, I've lost my value. I, well, I can't teach a class anymore. Well, I'm not, you know, I used to be able to do all the groundskeeping. I can't do that anymore. I don't have any stamina. My back hurts, my head hurts. Sometimes that's what we're called to, suffering. It's how we react to that suffering that makes it worth something to God. Now, the calls come, these four calls, they come at different times and in different ways, but they all have several things in common. Let me just share those with you and the lesson will be yours. First of all, they all come from God Himself. Know that when the preacher calls you to repent and be baptized or urges you to be restored, God Himself is calling you. I, I'm not allowing to myself or to Marty or Mike an importance that we, we don't have. But from this pulpit and from this word, when we appeal to you and call on you, to be saved or to be sanctified or to serve or to suffer in faithfulness. It is God Himself through His word that is calling you. Know that when your heart desires to be right with Christ, God Himself is calling you. Every time the word or the church or your conscience calls you to come to Christ or to come closer to Christ, you have heard the voice of God calling you to that end. And so the first thing that all these calls have in common is that they all come from God Himself. Secondly, they are all calls for blessing or for cursing. You know, there's a simple division and decision in each one of these calls. 
each respond will bring a blessing or will bring a curse. So the call to salvation, well, is either salvation or condemnation. The call of sanctification, greater spirituality or greater carnality. The call to growth and serve is a call to grow in Christ or a call to die in Christ. The call of suffering will either bring us peace or turmoil. It depends on how we respond. You can't ignore the calls, you must choose. And failing to choose properly is choosing to reject what God is offering. In the end, each person will spend eternity either regretting or rejoicing the responses that they have made to all of these calls. And then thirdly, another thing that all these calls have in common, they're all urgent. The calling is gentle, the calling is insistent and direct at times, sometimes even dramatic, but the call will not always be there. You know, the call to be saved will stop abruptly when you die or when Jesus comes. And the call to sanctification is extinguished as we continue in sin and worldliness. You know, some people get confused thinking that if their conscience does not bother them anymore when they sin, it must mean that this is okay with God. I mean, if your conscience doesn't bother you when you sin, it means that God no longer controls you. Satan does. That's what that means. The call to service, if ignored, will no longer find our ear. The call to suffering for Christ can be drowned out by our own anger and depression. Each call must be answered now if we are to receive the blessings that are attached to each call. You know, every day, in a variety of ways, God is calling each one of us, every day. The question is, are we listening? Are we responding? Which call are you hearing today? Is the Lord calling you to be saved? Is the Lord calling you to purify some aspect of your life, to walk with Him more deeply than ever before? Is that the call? Is God calling you to serve Him in some way that you never have before, or with a new attitude? Perhaps even join this congregation if you haven't and serve with us. And is God calling your attention to the fact that your suffering is valuable to Him? and that you should submit to it in faith and in patience? Let's never forget that God can tell time. We think somehow He doesn't know what time it is. God knows to the heartbeat when your suffering begins and when your suffering will end. He knows that. There's no need to pray about that particular thing. The prayer that we need is to help us be patient with His timetable. That's always the difficult thing. We have our timetable. This ought to be over here because I got to do this and then I got to do that. And when we're suffering and when we're in a situation that's difficult and it's all uphill, we have to give away, you know, we have to, the first step in acceptance is to throw away our timetable and say, okay, Lord, all right, we're on your timetable. Please help me to be on your timetable. Help me to forget my own. And so whatever way that God is calling you or has called you today, I encourage you to respond to Him. Some responses are private, obviously, in our own hearts when we say to the Lord, yes, Lord, on this or that or whatever. And some responses are public and if at this time you need to make a public response, either to confess Christ, to be baptized, to confess sin and, and, find, uh, and find forgiveness, whatever, whatever your response is, uh, is uh, necessary tonight, we encourage you to do that now as Mike leads us in our, in our song of encouragement.